Okay, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. It is on the increase in the U.S. Why is that? Why is TB on the increase? Used to be years ago, there um, there were TB tuberculosis sanitariums. Uh, they thought the best way to treat these patients, to get them away from the population, is to send them to a sanitarium. So um, they were basically cut off from uh, their general population and family. They didn't want anybody else catching it, so they were treated there with lots of fresh air and rest and good nutrition and walking. And um, it was kind of a very nice bucolic setting. Uh, we don't have those anymore uh, because we have better ways to treat and detect. So there is a form of increased latent TB. Latent TB is someone who's infected with it but it's not active. So what happens in the latent TB is you bring in the bacteria but you have a strong immune system that keeps the bacilli contained. So when would latent TB become active? Well, if your immune system drops, if you develop an immunocompromised disease, um, diseases, HIV, AIDS, certain medications can drop that. So if you've seen the commercial on TV of Humira, um, adalimumab is the medication. It's a protein that blocks the inflammatory effects of the tumor necrosis factor alpha TNF. So this is a great medication for patients that have uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, patients that have Crohn's disease, um, a whole bunch of different diseases, they take this. Well, this medication, because it will reduce your um, immune system, if you have latent TB, you will develop active TB. So it is required the patients start this, have to have TB tests to make sure they're not going to get TB. And if they do, they need to treat them. So so you're doing screening at a health clinic. Which assessment questions would be important to ask? What are you going to ask the patients? If you're doing screening at the public health clinic, who's at a high risk for having TB? Well, probably number one, you would ask, have you traveled to a foreign country? Boy, that sounds like Ebola right now, doesn't it? So there's a lot of panic about TB and acquiring TB. It's usually sped by repeated, prolonged, close contact with somebody that has it. So you're six inches from the infected person's mouth and you're breathing in lots of bacilli. Uh, so it's not just randomly walking by somebody. It's prolonged, close contact. Um, I think that's what they discovered after the sanitariums were around when they got more information that just you're not going to catch this unless you're in really close proximity for a long time. So we don't need to isolate the patients in sanitariums anymore. So number one way to do the test is we do a tuberculin skin test. You've all had it. It's also called a PPD. It's also called a Manto test. It's all the same thing. We use a little bit of purified protein derivative. We It's only 0.1 ml. We give that to the patient how? And then we read that between 48 and 72 hours. We're looking for an induration, not just a red spot, but an induration, meaning it's raised. It's not flat like the skin, but it's raised. So if you're greater, equal or greater to five millimeters on an induration, that is a negative test, unless you have HIV, AIDS, or immunocompromised disease, cancer, you could be taking chemotherapy, radiation, um, other diseases, then that could be a positive result for them and further testing would need to be done. If it's equal or greater than 10 millimeters, then that would be active for a normal um, patient without immunocompromised issues. 
So it's positive. Now let's do, we can do a sputum. You collect a sputum in the morning for an acid fast bacillus smear. So when you do a sputum, they need to rinse their mouth first. It's a sterile container. They basically spit up in a sterile container that gets sent down to lab. So they will test that and see if you have acid fast um, pneumonia bacilli in there. Um, you're cured from TB when you have three negative sputum tests, three mornings in a row, and that is how they know if the medication has worked. So treatment, you take a combination of drugs, they are either rifampin, isonazide, or pyrazinamide. These are all horrible drugs. They're not fun to take. Um, all the meds can cause non-viral hepatitis. Meds are taken daily up to nine months and they decide which ones to take. Um, rifampin, I believe it is, one of those you have to promise that you will use protection all the time because they are, they cause some birth, birth defects. Um, so a lot of teaching with the patient. If a patient's hospitalized with TB, we know that they need to be on airborne precautions, the HEPA mask, the N95, and in the negative pressure room. If a patient needs to leave to go down to have a test, we just put a normal mask on them and wheel them down for the test. Now, there's a lot of controversy. Well, my word, if they have active TB, someone's going to catch it. Well, remember, you need long-term exposure prolonged, very close to their face to be able to pick up enough organisms that could cause TB. So the odds of that happening are very, very low. So the medications, um, if they cause any of these, um, persistently dark uh, rash, nausea, loss of appetite. If you're not getting enough um, food in, then may need to change the medication combination. Persistently dark urine, that's an issue because obviously if you have that, that means you've got really bad hepatitis. It can also cause neuropathy. The other thing previously on this one is rifampin turns your bodily fluids red-orange. So that's normal. Uh, that'll happen as long as you're taking it, but it's okay. So symptoms of active TB. Active TB, you're tired, you have malaise, don't want to do anything, anorexic, you're going to lose weight, low-grade fevers, night sweats, you would be coughing up mucoid-filled sputum, and there's a misnomer that if you have active TB, you would cough up blood. That is not for every patient and it's usually in very very late stages when you're dying from TB so that's not a run-of-the-mill symptom for most active TB patients. Um, TB is classified um, 0 to 5 so in your book it'll talk about what each stage means 0 to 5 So let's talk about lung cancers, different kinds of lung cancers. There is squamous cell lung cancer. Um, that usually happens between 50 and 60 years, more in men and cigarette smokers. It metastasizes locally. Notice that's 30% of the patients. Then there's small cell. It's also called oak cell lung cancer same age period of patients that develop this one. Um, it metastasizes early through the lymph system. Um, this is a bad one because the prognosis is very poor. Nine to ten months, death usually a few months after. Um, so a very virulent form of cancer. There's another one called adenocarcinoma 30 to 35. Um, this one is not related to smoking, so probably when we hear of somebody that has cancer of the lungs and a common thing of those, I can't believe they got that, they're not even a smoker. Well, they probably have this one because smoking is not related to 
Um, so no smoking risk factor for adenocarcinoma. It's got a poor prognosis and it metastasizes early, although um, its death is not as fast with this one as it is the other one. And then large cell cancer. Um, this basically grows into the trachea, uh, peripheral and the central. So signs and symptoms of anybody that has any of these lung cancers. Well, lots of times, like any disease, you don't know what's going on till it's quite well advanced. So this can imitate other pulmonary issues. So there's no typical onset. It looks like pneumonia. Um, but it doesn't go away. You have cough. You may have hemoptysis, but it's common. Well, okay, somebody may say, well, you're coughing so hard because you have bronchitis and you must have just broke a little bleb and that's what it caused you to bleed. Um, so wheezing. This, these patients, though, because of that, because of the air, they're going to have a rapid development of digital clubbing, anorexia, fatigue, weight loss. So weight loss is late so um, you know there's really no one thing that is probably going to bring that although if you have hemoptysis then that would be something you'd want to check with your doctor so hopefully the doctor would they do some tests and find out maybe a bronchoscopy find out why you're coughing up blood if it happens just once and not again some patients may not go to the ER they may not go to their doctor so Maybe it's a year later they visit their doctor. Doctor says, have you ever coughed up blood lately? Oh, yeah, I did last year. Oh, well, and anything else new? Well, I have this cough I can't get rid of. Well, okay, well, you know, they can have cancer and not have known it. Um, although the kind of cancer you would have, if you have one that rapidly progresses, there may not be a lot that can be done to begin with. So. So treatment, obviously, is going to be chemotherapy, radiation, um, surgery, taking out a lobe of your lung, if that will help. Um, so those treatments in and of itself have a lot of side effects. So it's a quality of life. How, do the, how does the patient want to live? What do they want to do? Um, you know, where do they go from here?